All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody who's joining us. Uh, good afternoon or morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. And welcome to our 14th event in our Outcomes Estimation Tools Training Webinar Series. This time, we're featuring the Chesapeake Assessment Scenario Tool, or CAST. So thank you for being here today. I'm Aisha Tap ross Water and Soil Health Scientist for American Farmland Trust, and I'm joined by my colleague, research, research scientist, Jen Tillman. Uh, for those of you who don't know, American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit founded in 1980. Our mission is to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land and preparing the next generation of farmers. For today's webinar, after a few reminders and a quick poll to see who's in the room, we'll hear from Olivia Devereaux, president of Devereaux Consulting Inc. She will first lead us in a presentation of CAST, followed by a demonstration of the tool and then a brief Q&A. And we want to thank our funders, the EPA Office of Water, the Walton Family Foundation, and the Mosaic Foundation for making this webinar series possible. Now for some quick housekeeping reminders. We are using the Zoom webinar platform for this series. So as attendees, you'll have your camera and microphones off for the, uh, throughout the event. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen at any time to ask questions, and the speakers will answer the questions during the last 15 minutes of the event. You can use your name or be anonymous when asking questions or making comments. We also do have the capability to unmute you, so please indicate in the question if you would like to ask it yourself. Um, if you're having any te technical difficulties, you can direct message Jen and she'll try to assist you. And following each webinar, you will receive an email within three to four days that will provide the recording and the slides for the presentations, as well as information about the next month's speaker. And by the following Monday, we will post the recordings to the webinar registration page, which we absolutely welcome you to share with your colleagues and friends that may be interested in viewing. In a moment, Jen will be sharing a link to a nine question evaluation survey, which you can choose to answer anonymously that should take you about two minutes to complete. The survey will pop up when you leave, but you can also click it now so it opens in the new tab in your browser. We ask that you please complete the survey right after the event ends. Our presenters and the AFD team rely on these surveys to help inform our next month's speaker and any changes we might need to make to the webinar series. We are also offering an incentive for completing the survey. Everyone who fills out a survey today before 6 p.m. Eastern will be entered to win a $25 Visa gift card. The winner will be notified by email tomorrow morning. So we appreciate your participation and wish you luck in the drawing. So now let's see who's in the room for this event. So Jen, in a second, we'll share a quick poll. Um, so question number one, which one sector best reflects your occupation? We have government agency, non-government organization, academic, uh, corporation, uh, or environmental markets developer, or other. Uh, two, if there are only four types of audience members, uh, which one best describes you? Are you a developer, a current user? a potential future user, or a person who's just interested in learning about the outcomes estimation tools? And what is your experience level with CAST? Had you, uh, you've you not heard of it, you've heard of it but never used it, you've heard of it and used it, or you refer to it often? So we're gonna give you a few minutes to uh, answer these just full. And it looks like just about everyone's answered. So I'll stop the poll. All right. So it looks like once again, uh, almost everybody that's joining us is from some sort of a government agency followed by a non-government organization. Um, we have mostly potential future users of outcomes estimation tools. Uh, with it looks like current users coming up second and closely after that, 
uh, people who are interested in learning about outcomes estimation tools. And then most people have not heard of CAST. A few have heard of it, but never used it. And then we have some sprinklings of people that have heard of it, used it and refer to it often. You can see the results there. Okay, I'm just gonna. Great. Um, there we go. Um, so on the registration site that Jen is sharing in the chat, you'll see this webinar schedule and links to the recordings, including the most recent uh, May 1st Comet Toolkit training that includes Comet Farm and Comet Planner. Next month on July 10th, we'll be joined by Anne-Marie Nardi, Marketing and Communications Specialist with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Haley Summers, Agriculture Geospatial Data Scientist with Sand County Foundation, and Greg Haddish, a GIS Specialist with NRCS Iowa, who will present on the Agricultural uh, Conservation Planning Framework, ACPF. Uh, we have also had some changes to our future webinars. The Predictive Soil Health Economic Calculator training that was scheduled for September has been canceled. However, we are in talks for a potential one-hour webinar on geographic targeting for that September date, and we will be taking a one-month break through August. So stay tuned for um, those updates. And without further ado, if Olivia is ready, we can go ahead and... Um, start her presentation. I am ready. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'm excited that a number of people are not familiar with it. And this is going to be their uh, first introduction to CAST. Um, that's always very exciting to be able to present to a group who is, is new uh, to the tool. We have about 2,000 users, so um, it's it'll be fun to add add some new ones. Um, I wanted to start off by talking. Uh, uh, let me let me get the right slide up here. Apologize for that. Wanted to start off by introducing myself. My name is Olivia Devereaux, and um, I have worked on environmental initiatives for a long time now. Um, I use the pronouns she and her, uh, and I wanted to talk about how do we quantify water quality outcomes. Um, I am work at Devereaux Consulting. It's the company I founded. Uh, and uh, Helen, Helen Galamoski works with me. She's also on the call. Um, and she prepared a, the bulk of these slides. So thanks to Helen. Um, I do work on linked management and watershed models with the focus really on, on how do we manage watersheds? How do we manage farms? Um, what is the best way to address issues related to environmental improvement? Um, while using the great watershed model data that we have. I do have a master's degree in soil science from the University of Maryland in College Park and uh, have a good background in agriculture and that really helps me to be able to understand the concerns that the ag community comes with and uh, make sure that the work that we do is, is applicable to conservation project managers. Um, my company does a lot of work with USGS, the United States Geological Survey, with Delaware, um, and a lot of different conservation districts throughout the United States. Um, and we are also a contractor to the Chesapeake Bay Program, and our role has been to develop and support CAST over many, many years now. Um, and so I want to uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, and I'm ready to move on to the next slide now. Um, what I want to do in this presentation is spend about 10 minutes going over the, the data that we use in CAST, um, provide a little bit of an introduction on nitrogen and phosphorus source data um, and trends over time, and then talk about how do we look at scenarios, how do we create those, how do we then look at the outcomes from those scenarios, and I'll show you different ways to look at data um, and spend about 25 minutes on that, and then a few minutes on some additional resources. Uh, we're not here just for this one webinar. We're here all the time, and I'll show you how to get to some additional information. And then from there, uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, &A and, and as Aisha had said, we can do that verbally or through the chat. 
And Helen can answer questions in the chat or question and answer box as we go along. Um, so just to give you a snapshot of features, and this has been done on the other webinars that the American Farmland Trust has hosted, I want to give you a, just a, a kind of an overview here, since y'all most of y'all are fairly new to, to CAST. CAST represents uh, uh, the, the loads for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment at a sub-county level. Um, it is not necessarily a farm scale level, but it is at a smaller scale, and we take into account landscape characteristics at that smaller scale. You can absolutely use CAS to model anything at a farm scale um, or a project specific scale, and we we do that using a loading rate. When when I say loading rate, I mean pounds per acre. And I know physicists will always tell me that that's not a rate, um, but in agriculture it is. That's the loading rate. So we we have output at the pounds per acre scale. So pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment at pounds per acre, and that is how we model things at something smaller than that sub-county scale. Um, we have an average hydrology. It's over an average of a 20-year period, so it doesn't reflect what happens in a wet year or a dry year or any other specific year. Um, instead, we are looking at that average year, and that's intentional. We certainly can do it at a specific year for specific weather, but we're looking at it for an average because we want to say generally these are the the loads that you would have running off the land into the streams and rivers and and ultimately into the chesapeake bay um and so that's the intention is to look at what happens on average in any average year um now the other thing that we have uh in cast is that we do make sure that there's plenty of data to inform decision making um, and to be able to translate those BMPs into ecosystem benefits. Sometimes those are called co-benefits um, and to provide maps and graphs and all kinds of tools to help the, the user to be able to communicate results. Um, but our specific numerical output is in terms of pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment or pounds per acre um, of different types of land uses, and I'll go over the land uses in a, in a moment. The conservation practices we model, um, the, we have quite a few, uh, We, but I've listed kind of general general ones here. A lot of different types of cover crops, and including commodity versus uh, the traditional cover, manure transport, and all of these other ones. Um, that are listed here, and I'm not going to read the list, but we do have quite a quite a few options for modeling conservation practices. Um, we have a set of names that we use at the Chesapeake Bay program, and we 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 will show you how to translate NRCS names or other names into the names that are used at the Chesapeake Bay program, and how to look up the definitions to make sure they're the same. We also have a number of different land use and production systems. So we have agriculture, but we also model the developed or urban sector, natural sector like uh, wetlands and forest, as well as septic and wastewater. In the ag sector, we have cropland, hay and pasture, as well as the production area, which we call feeding space. Um, and, and we break down the cropland and the hay and pasture into some uh, other finer categories. Um, we do model for the all the counties that intersect the Chesapeake Bay drainage area, and the drainage area is about 64,000 square miles. It's fairly large. Um, it includes the southern part of New York that drains to the Susquehanna River, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, as well as the District of Columbia, although we don't model any agriculture in the district. Um, we, we expect the user to come to the tool with some knowledge um, of conservation practices or BMPs, best management practices. And uh, if you don't know what a cover crop is or you don't know what a nutrient management plan is, then it's gonna be a, a little bit harder for you to get started using the tool. So we do, we do hope that people have that knowledge when they start off. Uh, when the first time you use it, it'll take a little longer um, and it could take you maybe an hour to do something that with some experience might take you five minutes. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the amount of time and skills that are needed to use the tool. And then uh, we have targeting maps to tell you uh, information about what the uh, most effective location is for targeting management practices. And we have those for both ag and urban and for, for targeting for nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment. And I just want to make sure you all knew that we have that kind of information available on the tool. And that's on the home page. And I'll show you that toward the end. Um, let me move now to talking about if CAST is right to you. Again, if you're working in a geography that drains to the Chesapeake Bay, those seven states, then, then it would work for you. Um, we have users from all over the world, and, including Norway and uh, and Australia, um, and because they're working in the Chesapeake Bay as well. If we have the time period for 1985 to 2025. We recently added data out to 2035, so that's new, um, but we've we've added that. Um, but you'll see in all the slides that we go out to uh, to 2025 because we just added out to 2035. Um, we do model, allow modeling the geographies or county. Um, you can use it at a project using that pounds per acre. Um, state watersheds of various sizes. We use the USGS hydrologic unit codes, or the acronym there is HUC. Um, and we have HUC, HUC 8, HUC 10, HUC 12. The, the larger the number, the more defined it is, the more smaller it is. And we model nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. We will be adding uh, soil carbon storage um, and uh, carbon equivalency, the same as, as, as is in Comet. Um, but we ex don't expect that to be done toward until the end of this calendar year. But we will be adding that. The benefit is that you don't need to download or maintain any special software. You just need an internet connection. Um, and you can go to the website. It's free. Uh, and I believe that um, that that Jen has put that link in the in the uh, chat, so you can go to the uh, website now. Um, it is the official tool used by the Chesapeake Bay Program for evaluating the Bay TMDL, and that was why it was originally developed was for the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. It's a TMDL that EPA established covering the entire 64,000 square miles, so the whole drainage area of the Chesapeake Bay. And um, that TMDL came out in 2010, and we established this tool in 2011 to help people uh, determine what they could do to, to reduce loads to the bay. Um, so you'll see that we have a couple of different geographies. One of them is edge of stream. It's the edge of a small stream. The other geography is the edge of tide, the edge of the tidal area of the bay. I expect that most of you will be using it for the edge of stream scale. Um, both are provided in any report or output. So, you know, you just need to know which one you want to look at. Um, the reason it's important that it's the official tool is that anything you do uh, may need to be consistent with, with what the states are trying to do in their commitments for um, achieving a swimmable and fishable Chesapeake Bay. So. Uh, so that's why this is important that it's it's uh, consistent with what the Bay Program is using. Um, so in continuing look at CAST is right for you. Most of the agricultural inputs are from USDA data. That would be the Ag Census and National Agricultural Statistics Service or survey, the surveys they do. And most of those data are at the county scale. Um, so the inputs are at the county, so it's not like we've got inputs at a farm scale. We're using county scale inputs and using those the, the land use, which is quite fine scale, to distribute the input data for manure, fertilizer, all of that information. The time period goes back to 1985, um, but the best management practice data is best in years after 2006. That's the data that comes from NRCS, and um, their data goes back to 2006, which is the year they had a big database changeover. And so we, we don't have great data prior to that, although we do have some from the states. But again, the, better, the data is better for years after 2006. Um, we do have GIS features uh, in terms of maps that we provide, but we don't have explicit 
GIS uh, fit features for planning, like put a point on a map, and you'll see that. But we are working on adding those and, and we'll evolve and, and get that up to speed in the next year or two. Um, we don't yet include carbon bacteria or other co-benefits in terms of a numerical estimation. Carbon will be in probably by the end of the year, um, hopefully sooner. And uh, there's no plan to put any of those others in right now, but we're talking about it and likely will. I just don't have anything firm on that. So those are the limitations um, in that we don't you know, allow you to say exactly how many pounds you're putting fertilizer on your farm or field, but we do have the estimates in there based on the other inputs, number of animals, that sort of thing. Um, and so you can model it uh, using those pounds per acre, but, um, but it is really a model that's at a little bit larger scale, uh, though you can apply the results to a smaller scale. Um, so I've gone over these other things uh, for whether or not CAST is right for you. Um, here are some examples of people who have used CAST. The Sustainable Chesapeake is a fantastic non-governmental organization or NGO, and they have used it to look at, to do an analysis to demonstrate the value of manure injection um, and to promote wider adoption of this practice. So they wanted to quantify what would the load reduction be for nutrients and sediment if manure were injected into the soil as opposed to surface applied. Um, and being able to quantify that was extremely helpful to them in terms of uh, kind of making the case for, for folks to do that practice and also so that they could get funding to uh, support the work they do with farmers. The Conservation Innovation Fund is another NGO and they do have done various projects throughout the watershed um, including looking at the Mid-Atlantic Climate Smart Commodity Program and the Maryland Clean Water Commerce Act uh, projects. Um, so those are pay for performance approaches. And when you do pay for performance, the performance measurement is not whether or not you did the management practice, but instead it is what is the load reduction that came from doing the management practice or a set of management practices. So they're, they're using uh, CAST for that purpose, and that gives them the opportunity to look at those uh, scope three supply chain uh, insets for corporations. And that scope three supply chain inset is a, is a term of art that is used when looking at uh, pay for performance and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, among other things. Res is a for-profit company and they have, um, do ecological restoration and they have estimated nutrient sediment reductions for stream restoration projects. Um, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission and other river basin commissions um, have used CAST. The Susquehanna River Bas Basin Commission requires all of the Conowingo Watershed Implementation Plan grant applications to, to use uh, applicants to use CAST to estimate their load reductions, and that helps the SRBC to estimate the, um, to determine, you know, the value of each of the projects and to rate those accordingly. The Chesapeake Bay Program has a number of work groups, um, and they use CAST for various reasons. The forestry work group in particular uses it to update their indicators on um, the amount of BMPs that are used to uh, to improve forests and to increase forests in the Chesapeake Bay. So looking at buffer implementation, for example. I wanna jump in now um, and see if there, uh, show you some trends over time graphs and the ways that we can answer these. So um, I will, uh, walk you through some screenshots of CAST. Um, this is the fail-safe way to demo a tool. Um, so you won't see the banner here. It won't look exactly like your computer screen, but um, but I but I will walk you through where you would go and click to get through. And this is a nice resource. I have this PowerPoint later um, so that you can kind of use it as a as a way to re refresh your memory on where you, where I clicked and where you can go. So um, under track progress on the home screen, the home screen has login and a banner at the top. And then underneath, you've got these resources. If you click on track progress, um, there are a number of things that are listed there that 
uh, have the different um, the different trends over time. We have the BMPs implemented. We've got loads, wastewater, nutrient supplied. Um, that's your manure and your fertilizer. We've got animal numbers, septics, manure transport, and tidal water quality trends. So here's the one on loads delivered to the streams in the bay. What we're looking at here are the years um, on the left. So at the top, we've got four tabs and I'm showing you the loads by source and I picked the county Jefferson, West Virginia. This is a just digesting all of the data in CAST and, um, and so we've got it by county. You can log into CAST and get the same data and create the same graphs on your own. Um, but I selected West Virginia, Jefferson County. I limited this the years to 2014 through 2022. And I wanted to look at nitrogen at the edge of stream. I could also have picked phosphorus or sediment. So in Jefferson County, there's not been much change between 2014 and 2022. It looks pretty flat at the top with slight decreases uh, in 2021 and 2022. These are simply in terms of pounds over here. We're looking at the loading rate, pounds per acre, because it could be that there's been a change in um, nutrients, uh, a change in the acres, uh, not just in terms of the nutrient supply, the nitrogen applied. Ag is green. We can say still see that you know there's not been much change in the acres of ag or in the amount applied to ag land over that time period. So that's useful to know that there's been very little change in Jefferson County over those years. Here's one with manure transport. There are three tabs on that tab. And if I look at the percent um, of manure transport, the center tab, and I'm picking Frederick, Maryland, I'm trying to kind of walk through different parts of the watershed. I can see that in the time period 2001 through 2025, that the blue is the amount transported in, the green is the amount transported out. Um, it's interesting because I can see that the amount tra transported out in some years kind of matches the amount transported in, but not in all, all years. Um, and if I go to the next slide, I can look at the animals. So the manure obviously comes from animals. We all know that. Um, and just looking at the entire history of 85 to 2025 for the same county, Frederick, Maryland, Looking here at both livestock and poultry, I could change that so we were just looking at poultry, which is what is most likely to be transported. And I can see that in terms of animal units, there's another option to pick number of animals too, that, that I can see that they, they used to have a lot of dairy. The dairy is decreasing over time. Um, down here in turkeys, they've had a little bump down in the year 2022, but it went back up. Um, I don't know what that was. I would have to call the county conservation district and ask them if they know. Um, they've pretty much eliminated all hogs. That seems to be true for pretty much all of Maryland. I think Virginia is going to be getting some a new hog operation in there, but um, most most of the hog operations are further south, not in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and we can see that they're mostly a cattle cattle county, less poultry. Um, so, you know, that's good information to kind of have in your mind when you're looking at, well, what do we need to address here? You know, you're dealing more with dairy and beef. Um, so that's some background information that's always useful to explore uh, before you, you get into it, unless you already know. And if you already know and you're working at a farm scale, then you don't need that tool. But if you're looking at a much broader scale, then that's kind of a nice way to, uh, to, to get an idea of what's going on in a particular location. So looking at scenarios, um, I want to start with a point that some of y'all may be at, which is um, you're working with NRCS, maybe you're working on the Climate Smart Agricultural uh, Program. Um, here's just a screenshot from NRCS, and we're just showing the, the practices that are allowable. Um, they recently added this cover crop to improve moisture use efficiency and reduce salts. That's a good one. Um, but you can see that they've got their list and they've got the practice codes um, from NRCS. That's not what we use in CAST. So instead, what I would do is take you to the home page, take you to the BMP tab. Once you're on the BMP tab, you click there and up comes this, this page. 
At the bottom, you'll see this link to USDA practices. USDA, of course, includes NRCS and FSA practices. NIAN, which is a term used by the Bay Program for annual progress reporting and is not particularly useful to you, but also the CAS BMPs. And if you download that spreadsheet, it opens to a README. Um, and there's some information here. I always recommend that people read the readmes. No one wants to, um, but it's I find it to be helpful. And then if you go to the first tab, then you'll see the data. And here we're looking at the data for waste treatment lagoons. That's practice 359. Um, and an NRCS actually calls that a waste treatment lagoon. And you can see that uh, that if we go over to the cast side, the blue, and I tried to color code it so that everybody could keep it straight, that what the Bay Program calls that is an animal waste management system. And there's a definition, definition here so you can see that. And the acronym that the Bay Program uses is AWMS. Um, so you could look at it that way and say, oh, okay, we're doing this NRCS practice 359. But when we use CAST, we need to call it an animal waste management system. Um, and now you know that you know, you're doing the same thing. And if you wanted to filter um, the, the spreadsheet and take a look, you could say, oh, I'm really interested in riparian forest buffers. And that's practice 391. Um, of course, you know, you've got the enhancement practices from the, uh, uh, from, from the, from the NRCS program. Um, for those and the original practice, and you can filter by uh, using Excel, you can just filter that spreadsheet for 391 and up would come all of your forest buffers. So that's how you would use that spreadsheet to kind of crosswalk the NRCS names to the CAS names. Now, delving into the tool further, there are also ecosystem benefits. So like I said, CAS models nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment but you might wanna know, well, what are the other benefits? Um, so you can either go to this ecosystem benefits link here or right here. People love this tool. It doesn't quantify, but it does provide qualitative information. And so I'll show you what that looks like. If you're looking at climate adaption, which you would be if you were doing climate smart, then you would wanna know, well, what is the climate resiliency? What is climate adaption? Which practices would be really good for that? It's going to be your buffers. It's going to be wetlands, anything with a tree. Um, so that gives you a little more information. And you can click um, over here on climate adaption or any of these other outcomes to go there. Diversity is always really useful um, because we're all trying to reach more diverse audiences to expand the reach. Um, the definition comes up over here. And then if you click on that little I on any of these, then up comes uh, the link the linkage between climate adaption and the ag forest buffer. So you get a little more definition there and that can be useful to help us understand, well, what is that connection? Again, it's not quantifying anything, but it is really useful to see those connections. So moving forward, if I go to the tool, I can log in. If you don't have a login, you can register for one just by clicking the register button. Anybody can register, it's an automated process, there's no approval, and it is private. Nobody looks at your data. Um, it is not open to EPA or any other government agency. Nobody can do meta-analysis or big data analysis um, with the data. We'll, you can just register your scenarios are your, or are your own. The ones that are public scenarios are ones that the states report, not anything that y'all would create. Um, so that's, I just want to be clear about that. So if you log in, and this is Helen Golomowski, who's on the call answering your questions, um, her login, and she logged in here, click the login button, and here we see um, the scenarios, and these are shared scenarios, so everybody can see these down here. Those are the public scenarios, they're owned by, not a real person, but CBP admin, and then down up at the top are the ones that are just yours. So you can see a little bit on what Helen's been working on um, with the Lancaster and Tioga, um, Pocomoke River, the Delaware Wildlands, Pocomoke. Um, so you can see a little bit of the scenarios she's been working on. And these are the scenarios you created. When you click on these question marks, and you'll see them throughout the tool in different places, 
um, information will pop up that can be helpful to you. So here we've got this, this page, the scenarios page. And the first thing you probably want to do is click add new scenario to create a new scenario. And then that pops this page and there's a lot to fill out here. So I'm going to walk you through what, what's included. The first thing is to enter a unique scenario name. Um, and then you'll put in a definition, a description. So the, the name is just 2022 baseline. Uh, and then the description is that the purpose was to establish a baseline and the year and the geography, um, whatever is useful information that's really just for you. Then you need to select a base year. Um, and I generally select current zoning for all years after 2012. Um, select a wastewater data set. I know that y'all are looking at ag, but you still have to select one. Um, and I just select one that matches the same year that I'm modeling. And then you can select the BMPs available. More information about that is under that question mark. Um, you can do official or planning either way. Um, planning will have a few more in there. And then the next step is to select a cost profile because we do provide the cost per BMP. Here we're doing a scenario in Nelson County, Virginia. So uh, selected Virginia costs. Um, there is one that has the average for the whole watershed. And you can also tailor those costs up here on that tab to be specific for your own costs. Um, but we give you defaults in case you don't have those or don't care about them. Over here, you can select a geographic scale. Um, if you just want to use what's in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, leave that box checked. Otherwise, uncheck it, and you'll get the full county that includes the area outside the watershed. Here, I'm picking county, area in the watershed only, Nelson County, Virginia, fun place to visit. Um, and you can use the little arrow to move just that county over. It, note that I just typed NE here. So any county that has NE in it, like mineral, has any in it pops up, but that is just a you know quick way to limit the list so I don't have to look at all the on those 500 counties in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So you can move Nelson County over, and then scrolling down, um, you can see that you can you've got your existing scenario, and do you want to add existing BMPs to it? And the Bay program does use the term BMP, so that's what I'll use in this presentation. So. Here you can um, click single and you'll get a list and we can copy over all the ones from the 2022 progress. Those any scenario named progress has all the practices that are known to be on the ground and functioning in that year. Um, and so we wanna copy those in here. So we've got a appropriate baseline of what's already on the ground and functioning. And it could be a waste management system from it was implemented in you know, 1990, but still working just fine. Or it could be something that was implemented in 2022 and um, you know, it's brand new. So either way, uh, as long as it's on the ground and functioning, it, it copies over. When you're ready, click Save. And that shows up here, the editing, it'll say it's editing and adding. Um, and while that happens, and mostly these are fairly instantaneous, um, but we'll go ahead and add a new scenario. And when you add a new scenario, we come back to this screen. And this time we'll take a shortcut. We will copy an existing scenario without BMPs. And that's a shortcut because it's faster, but it is also a way to assure that you make all the same selections um, in case you forgot what you selected. So I'm going to pick this one we just created, this 2022 baseline. And um, and it comes up here already with all my selections in there, but it has just the word copy appended. So I'm going to go ahead and change that and change my description um, so that I've got a climate smart plan and that my purpose is to assess climate smart practice effectiveness. Um, and then it was, uh, let me go back, it said copy existing scenario without BMPs. So it made your selections for your kind of base conditions, but it didn't copy the BMPs. So I'm gonna wanna copy the same set of BMPs in the same way I did before. Click save. And now I've got both of them here and they're identical with the exception of the name and the description. So what I wanna do is add BMPs to this scenario and um, I will go in here and click edit. That is a button you can click 
uh, looks like a little pencil on paper is the icon. And it'll take me to this screen. And there are a lot of tabs here. I'm going to go straight to agriculture. And um, for agriculture, there's agriculture on the land. There are animals, things that address animals directly, and manure treatment BMP. So I'm going to go to the ag BMP. I can see that what is copied in are a bunch of grass buffers. Um, and there are 787 practice agricultural practices in Nelson County that are in here. And I'm going to go ahead and add a BMP. And when I click add a BMP, up pops a box. It allows me to specify the county. Or I could pick a smaller scale, like a hop within the county. And then I can pick a BMP. Here I'm going to pick a forest buffer. Um, it is not riparian. It is an upland one. And I'm going to put it on crops and hay. And um, I'm going to say it's a narrow one meaning it's less than 35 feet. And the, the typically a buffer is 35 feet as a minimum, or um, that if I pick narrow, it'll be less than 100. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it'll be less than 35 feet. And uh, put that on cropland, enter 100 acres. I know that's big, but um, if I'm not modeling something on a particular field, I could say I've got you know, 20 farmers, and they're each going to do five acres of buffers. Um, and I don't need to put those in in 20 different, you know, going through this process 20 times, I can do it all at once, um, if that's the case. So when you're ready, and you think you've got that all good, click add. Once you added it, it's at the top of the list. If you look at it, and you're like, oh, shoot, I did something wrong. I meant to put it in as 99. You can click this edit button and just change it. It's not a big deal. Um, and when you're done adding all your BMPs, just click on the scenarios at the top and that is a menu item and it'll take you back to the scenarios page. So now you have your two scenarios and they are different in something other than just name and description. Your climate smart plan now has those 100 acres of buffers. You can click run, just click those two buttons at the same time. Um, you know, each one after the other, and they will run concurrently. When they're done running, and you can't go to your results until they're done, but again, it's pretty much instantaneous. Um, it, it'll be about a minute. It's less than the amount of time it takes me to walk over the sink and fill my glass of water. Then you can click on results, and you've got a lot of options here. Um, and you can explore a number of those on your own, but I'm going to go to compare scenarios and show you what that looks like. If I click on compare scenarios, then I can pick county, click any, and I can see Nelson in that list and move Nelson over. I'm going to click all agencies. I'll explain that in a later slide. I'll pick the two scenarios I just created, the baseline and the climate smart plan. I can compare up to four scenarios, but you don't have to compare four. You, you can stop at just two. Go ahead and click compare scenarios. And then this menu come, this these tabs come up. So this is where I input the data and then I get cost in the acres, um, which is useful if you wanna see how acres change. So with a forest buffer, you changed your acres from cropland and hay to, to simply forest. Um, so you would see a change in acres, but what I really care about are the loads. So let me go there and I'm on the loads tab and there's nitrogen, phosphorus, and if I scroll down, there'd be sediment. On the loads tab, we have the load at edge of stream for agriculture. You can see it went from 326,000 to 323,000. I'm, I'm rounding in my verbal description here. And you can see that difference. Edge of tide again is what's delivered to the edge of the tidal area of the bay more interested here at the edge of the stream. And um, I can download this in a table or I can just look at it on the screen. These little carrots um, will expand the section. And if I expand the section, I can see that what changed for each of these land uses um, or load sources within agriculture. So I can get a little bit more detail there. Um, I want to go back though and, and point out that the natural sector will have, will have changed a little bit too because we added some forested acres. So going down here, um, 
we, we might want to look at the project level outcomes. I could have gone to that other tab here and looked at the loading rate under compare scenarios, so the pounds per acre, and just multiplied that times a farm field area. If I had a five acre farm field, I would just multiply the pounds per acre times five, and that would give me the load for that farm field as an example. But let's go through and take another look at uh, ways to analyze the data. We have graphs as an option. So if I click on graphs, I can go and make the same set of selections, Nelson County, all agencies, my two scenarios, and click graph. And what comes up are loads. So overall, what are the loads for nitrogen and phosphorus at edge of stream? The nice thing about these graphs is, and it's maybe not intuitive, so just make a mental note, you can click on the key and or this legend, and if you click on it, it will turn gray and not be available. If I clicked on the grayed out portion, it would become available. So if I didn't care about phosphorus, I would click on this and it would go away um, as an example. But I've got nitrogen and phosphorus at edge of stream. Sediment is, you know, we've got in terms of pounds. So um, it's a whole different scale here. So it's on a different graph. Um, and you can hover over here and see what the load is for that annual load per, it's the load per year um, that's delivered to the edge of a stream. And you can see the change in load here. Now, another way to look at this is to generate a report. Here is a list just in a PowerPoint slide of the list of reports. Um, we've got base conditions. We have the BMP files submitted versus credited has a lot of details in it. Some people like to start with the summary report, but if you're trying to get a got to delve into the details, you want to go to the submitted versus credited. Loads per unit is going to be your pounds per acre. Um, and the unit in most cases is acre, but not always. Um, and then the loads report gives you the total pounds like we were just looking at, total pounds per year, and then wastewater and some other items there. So we'll look at the BMP summary report. I clicked on that one um, under this drop down box. There, those were the options and I picked BMP summary. I gave it a name that makes sense to me. Doesn't matter what you name it. Honestly, when I'm going really fast, I just do ASDF or whatever's easy to just bang out on the keyboard. Um, someone showed me a screenshot from yesterday of what they put in and they were confused about something and they had named their scenario HMM for, hmm, I thought that was really cute. Um, but whatever you wanna name it is fine. And then if you want the entire uh, county, uncheck the watershed area. A county like Accomack in Virginia is going to be partly in the count, in the watershed and partly out. But here I left it checked. I just want what drains to the Chesapeake Bay for a county. I typed in and so I'm switching examples now. I'm going to a different example and I'm going to Queen Anne's County, Maryland. Um, and so I typed in and it's the only and county name in the watershed that has and with an E. And I moved that over. I wanted to look at my scenario, so I unchecked public, I unchecked anything that some individual user has shared with me uh, for collaboration. And here I clicked mine and I picked the 2022 baseline and a 2025 plan. And then I clicked submit report. And I go to the next tab over and I download the report and it comes up and this is where I download it. It will also be emailed to you and you can, um, click on it from your email if you prefer, but it, it generates within a minute. So I usually just go to the download tab and download it. This is what comes up for this report. There is a readme, please read it. Scenario details reminds you of what you picked. So if I forget which scenarios I put in here, I can go to the details and look at my details and then summary BMPs. So this report and um, I, I did for both the 2022 baseline and then um, I downloaded another report for this webinar besides the one I showed you on the screen that has a planned scenario for 2022 plan. Um, so I've got my baseline BMPs and then I have all those baseline BMPs plus a few more that I added. So let me show you what I added. I can see it here. 
um, but I'm gonna highlight it for you. Um, these first two columns show you the acres, and I know it's acres because of the units right here. Some of these are acres in buffers, um, and some of them are gonna be like septic systems will be number of systems. There'll be some other you know, units, but generally in agriculture, it's acres. So here are the acres. There is percent implementation over here. I don't recommend using it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to most people for because we don't have good domains for some of these management practices, especially for buffers. Um, here's what I did in this scenario of my 2022 baseline and my 2022 plan. I added a number of acres for nutrient application management for nitrogen. I also did it for phosphorus. Um, policy decisions were made at the Bay Program saying that we would model that implementation of nitrogen and phosphorus separately. So that was a decision that they made. And so I increased the acres uh, between my plan, my baseline and my plan for nutrient management, uh, phos nitrogen and phosphorus. I also added cover crops. Um, I added a huge amount of cover crops here. Um, and so you'll see that when I added all those cover crops, I maxed out the amount that could be added, which took away some of the cover crops that were commodity. So in essence, I converted those over to regular cover crops as opposed to the harvestable kind, which would be a commodity cover crop. So commodity decreased, but we did increase the cover crops. Um, and again, nutrient management, nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, let me show you what that looks like in a loads report. So here I did create report. I picked Anne Arundel again. Um, I picked my two scenarios and I picked different load source aggregations just to kind of play around a little bit and different agency aggregations to play around with it and submitted my report, download my report. And here it is, there's a readme. But I went all the way to the tab on the right because I wanted to show you all what the agency thing is. Um, it doesn't really apply to agriculture, but I wanted you just not to know what it is because you're using CAST, it has agencies in it. And I just want you to understand what it, what it is. So this report has the geography that I selected the sector, and you can see it goes down here, develop the load source um, in here. And then it also has the agency. So it has all the federal agencies, which are not attributed with agriculture. Um, and that was a policy decision. Of course, you know, like the agricultural research centers have agriculture. A number of, of the federal agencies rent out land for agriculture, but it was a policy decision at the Bay Program to not include that because they didn't track practices on it. Um, so you'll want to focus just on the non-federal acres. So while this report splits it out, you probably don't want to look at it that way. So here it is with all agencies lumped together. And, um, and I also put it in at minor source. This previous one, I just went back, had it at all the detailed load sources. I don't care whether it was on ag open space, double cropped, any of these others. I just wanted um, to, to look at it for a generally hay, pasture, row crop. I didn't care if it was corn or double crop or whatever. So it's all lumped together. And again, the agencies are all lumped together. So that's my favorite way of looking at it, but there are a lot of options and you can find out what your favorite way of looking at the data is. Um, so here I want to just highlight the pasture and the row crops because that's where we see the change from nutrient management and uh, from the other practices that were added. Um, so row crops, of course, that's the one here in the bottom of the three that are highlighted, um, had nutrient management on it and, um, and, and also the cover crops. Um, and so you'll see that that the baseline amount and the planned amount are right here. This refers to acres. So those are acres. Those acres did not change. The pasture acres did change because, and I didn't show you on the summary report because it got cut off on the screen, but the pasture acres did change because I added some buffers. But we don't want to focus so much on the amount 
So I want to focus on the nitrogen and then the phosphorus and then the sediment. And my screen is only so big. So we'll look here at nitrogen. The nitrogen went from 21,000, um, let me see if I can read this, 216,000 pounds to 176,000 pounds. So that was a reduction. And you can see that phosphorus reduced from 10 to 9,000 um, pounds. We also see that riparian pasture, that's the area uh, that intersects the streams, um, had a similar load reduction and from our, our forest buffers. And we can see that our pasture also had that same road re load reduction. So that's where we're seeing the reduction in agriculture. I wanted to point out natural. The stream load is calculated after everything else because everything drains to the stream, including the urban land. So we see that acres of stream or rather miles of stream do not change, but we do see that the uh, load did change in stream as well. Um, and that's because we saw these load up here change. So what drains to the stream is also gonna be lower and we take that into account. So um, there's a tendency that people have to wanna sum up everything in a column. And that's perfectly fine when you're looking at load and a good idea. Um, it's not so good when you're summing up amount because you'd be summing up acres, miles, and systems, and that's illogical. But you can certainly do that for adding up the total load. And just so that people don't get confused with the math, we provide the pounds per acre or pounds per unit, whatever that unit is. And that may be a way to just double check and make sure you don't, you know, do something that's illogical. If you're moving quickly, which I know I do. But um, that's the this report. And then uh, I think I, yeah, I showed you everything on this report. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was to go over the resources. Uh, and I want to do this fairly quickly so that I can leave plenty of time for questions. But if you go to the homepage and anybody can access this without even logging in, you can go to news, you can see newsletter and some other information. We send out a monthly newsletter to people who have created a login. Um, that way we have your email. We don't have your email otherwise. And we'll send you a newsletter with tips, um, user tips, upcoming webinars, um, and other information. So you might want to uh, get a login if for no other reason than to get the newsletter. Um, we also have learning. So there's some different items there under user documentation. We have a lot of how-to information. I recommend that people focus in on getting started. This is a lot to read. No one wants to read all day long. Um, people want to read as little as possible, I've noticed. Um, so I recommend you know just reading the getting started. And when you run scenarios, look at understanding results. Those are two important things. Um, free training videos are available. So here's an example. Um, of that page, uh, the, all our videos are free and recorded. So here we've got CASP 101, that's a full hour, but where do I start? Y'all are getting that today, but you could even just watch this two minute video on how to do that um, and, and then expand these plus signs to get additional information. And then also under learning, we have FAQs um, and Again, you can look at understanding results here, but there's you know a lot of other information here um, that you can take a look at and expand those and jump to all of the best management practices and categories are there and you can expand those and jump right to a section there for kind of the Q and A part of it. Um, and we have a lot of people who have contacted us over time and that allows us to be able to provide that information um, and no kind of anticipate questions. So under about, there's a lot of documentation available. So if you look at about cast, we just have a one page um, about cast. Where did it come from? Why is it here? Who should use it? Um, we also have model documentation. This is some in-depth documentation and uh, some information about versions. Um, we have an upgrade history. I, I find this useful to check. So if you go to about, again, the drop down menu, you could click update upgrade history. It's been upgraded since this screenshot, but it does tell you that we added a new coagulant enhanced 
treatment pond, that's an urban BMP. But you could go down here and see that animal mortality and ditch BMPs have their costs updated. Um, you could see, you know, the whole history of releases and what was, you know, improved over time. We also have develop a plan. This is a good way to kind of start off. What are we talking about here? What are your programmatic goals? What are you, you want your loads to be? What co-benefits are you focused on? What are the costs? How do you want to translate those to BMPs? What is the process? And it is a bit of a kind of what I call a tethered loop diagram um, because it's an iterative process or rather a recursive process where you're using information learned to kind of go through it again until you come up with the answer you need and you finish your plan. Um, but there's a lot of information on that page that walks you through the resources. Source data is really useful. You Here's just a table you can download that would show you all of the BMP definitions, the um, all of the all of the details here. There's also some agricultural data, like the amount of time we estimate animals are out in pasture, all kinds of information that you might may find useful. The BMP information has um, a lot of references, but one I wanted to call your attention to is a quick reference guide put together by Jackie Pickford, who's done a great job putting this together, um, along with this other information there. But it does give you a picture of a BMP, and it, it shows you all the BMPs and gives you kind of a picture of what it would look like and some other information, um, as well as all these other, you know, fast facts on manure BMPs and other information there. And then there's monitoring data. While this is a model, it is a calibrated model. So if you go to that page, you can go to this dashboard and um, you can click on one of these monitoring stations. And what will come up is the monitoring data collected for, um, for, for flow and time. Um, so it's a weighted regression uh, that's corrected. And those are the orange dots at this particular station. And then in the model, we have the what we got in terms of model loads for those points, and um, and it shows you how close they were. So they were pretty close um, for most years here, a little bit off in these uh, 1990 years, um, a little bit of an issue in 2011. And you can click on any of those stations and, and check that out. We've got a lot of other comparisons of modeling and monitoring data. Um, that are also available on that page. We have mapping tools. So until we actually integrate maps fully into CAST where you could upload a GIS layer or put your, your, your practice on a point or a line and draw it into CAST, we have mapping tools available. And that includes what I mentioned in the introduction uh, part where we talked about the targeting maps. So here's one for nitrogen. And again, we've got them for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment for ag and developed. And um, we've got this bivariate key where we look at where the delivery to the edge of a stream is high and also where have the um, loads been highest. Uh, and those are the two, two, two things that you're gonna wanna look at for where you wanna target. So when you get to the purple, it means that it was both a high delivery and a high load. So you'd wanna focus in on some purple areas there. Um, other resources, I mentioned we have costs and you can look at those. We've got an average for the whole watershed. We have them for each of the states. Um, you can also add your own costs. Um, if you wanna look at the reference information for where those data came from for ag, it was primarily from NRCS. Uh, technical documents, but for urban, it's a little bit all over the place, and you can see where our res what our resources were um, for citations. And we have this nifty little uh, graph that is helpful for showing, and I realize it's tiny here on this PowerPoint slide, but you can go to it, and you can pick a county over here, and you can see, well, what is the pounds per acre? Um, for each BMP, this is nitrogen, there's one for phosphorus, and also what, and it's, and it's got agriculture up above and developed down below. And then uh, you can also see what is the cost per pound reduced. So loafing lot um, has, loafing lot management is pretty expensive for the amount of load reduced. 
But if we were to do dairy precision feeding or anything with trees, they tend to be more cost effective. So those are the ones that I would target if I had a constraint on, on, on financial resources, which pretty much everybody does. Um, and that's the information. I, I guess I did wanna just mention the contact us button. When you click on that, it generates an email. That email goes to Helen and myself, and we are able to answer questions anytime. Um, and so we're always happy to have people contact us with something um, from, I can't remember how to log in, where is that button? Or, you know, I'm getting results that don't make sense to me, or I have this BMP, but it's not in CAS. What, what, do you, what, what should I do? You know, we'll, we're always happy to answer those questions. So you can email me directly at this email, or you can go to the contact us button on CAS um, and get either Helen or myself to answer questions. And that's all I have for you. I want to uh, stop here and take questions either verbally or in the Q&A. I don't see any new questions in the Q&A or chat, um, but feel free to unmute yourself and we can we can talk through this. And I can also go to... Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, if anybody has questions that they want to ask themselves, um, you can raise your hand or you can post in the Q&A that, that you would like to be unmuted and I can unmute you. Well, let's give it a little bit more time. Oh, and Olivia, I'm noticing that you're muted. Thanks. Um, if y'all get get uh, too quiet, I might I might go ahead and um, start showing you other cool features. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a question. It says, "Cast is such an all encompassing model." How long did it take to develop and what were the approximate costs? CAST was originally developed in, and I think I'm still sharing my screen. Um, if you go to about yes. CAST, it was originally developed in by Jessica Riggleman and myself in 2011. And then uh, we provided it to EPA, Chesapeake Bay Program, and uh, me, and, and, and it's been their tool ever since, and we've continued to support it along with Helen. Um, we initially developed it for really just a couple hundred thousand dollars, and um, then through grant funding, and uh, over the years, it has been improved, and it's part of the EPA Chesapeake Bay program budget, and I do not know what those costs are um, because we support it, but we don't, we don't host it any longer. It is hosted by the Bay program. Uh, kind of to go along with that, I've got a, a question that uh, piggybacks off of that. Um, are there plans to expand it outside of the Chesapeake Bay? And if not, if somebody wanted to do something similar in their own state, um, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, um, so we we there's no plan to expand this tool outside the Chesapeake Bay. However, um, we've done a similar tool. We built a similar tool in terms of capacity for Delaware, uh, where, and that tool um, is for the inland bays. It's the area outside the Chesapeake Bay. Delaware has about a third inside the Chesapeake Bay, and about two thirds of the state is outside the Chesapeake Bay. So, for the part that's outside the Chesapeake Bay, we developed a tool for them that models nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, and bacteria. Most of their local TMDLs are for bacteria, so that was important for them. And we're looking at what drains, you know, to the inland bays and the Atlantic Ocean basins. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about developing a similar model uh, in in another state or another watershed. And and sharing, you know, best the way we've gone about it and what's worked for us and and what some of the issues have been. 
Great. Thank you. Well, um, I guess if you want to show us one uh, other cool thing that you didn't get to show us, and then maybe we can wrap up a little early. Uh, we'll give people time to an ask any other questions if they have any. Okay. Um, under track progress, uh, we have information related to the Bay TMDL, which I think is going to be less interesting to most people. But we do have information over here with this trends over time. And I did show you the manure transport. And I showed you um, a, a little bit about nutrients. Um, but we do look at the trends in BMP implementation, which I think is important. Uh, I'm going to pick an example here. Um, I'm going to pick Pennsylvania. And I'm going to pick um, I'll, I'll leave it in terms of units there, and I'm going to deselect all, and I'm going to pick a BMP here, and I'm scrolling down to find one that I am interested in. Um, let's look here at uh, at at uh, t -t 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 manure incorporation, and I will gen then you have to click on generate the graph and table. And I'm just going to see what is the level of manure incorporation. And it's been kind of up and down. Um, and we can see that the intention in 2025 is to have more, but we see that either they're not reporting it or we have, um, you know, kind of an uneven implementation over time for that one. Um, if I go ahead and deselect that, and let's say I want to look at commodity and regular cover crops, we're going to see a different type of thing. Um, and here I'm looking at the implementation. There was a bit of a low spot here. And then you can see that there was an increase and then they dropped out and then there was another increase. This is their goal for 2025, but here's where they were last year for the commodity and cover crops. Um, and if you go down here, you can look at what's selected in the graph and I could even just, you know, move this to just do more current years. And so we have uh, kind of a follow-up question to what you're going over. Uh, it cool. says, uh, once a BMP is implemented, do you assume it remains in place? For example, cover crop use may vary year to year. It does vary. So the, we depend on the states to report the practices every year. Um, so cover crops need to be reported every year. And if they don't report it, we assume it didn't happen. And the there are BMPs like um, like buffers that once you implement it, we presume that it stays implemented and they don't need to report it again. But we do ask that they inspect it every 10 years to, or 15 years, really, to make sure that it's still there, that a Walmart wasn't put in that specific area of land. Um, and, or that uh, wasn't taken out by the farmer because commodity crop prices went really high and they decided to, to farm that little bit of land that might be more worth it. Um, we know that that happens sometimes. And so we do ask for an inspection, you know, every decade or so from, for a number of these practices. And if it's not inspected, we'll take it out. But generally we leave them in. Um, and generally the states report that they inspected it and it was still there or, or not. But um, there are those uh, those practices that persist over time, and then there are those that are annual, like a cover crop. But these do these annual scenarios, um, and you'll see them on the scenarios page over here. These are the shared scenarios. These are all the annual scenarios going back to 1985. These scenarios um, are using data provided by the states. So if you're working at a farm scale or you're working at a, at a county scale, it may be that data that, that people have were not reported to the state and that the state didn't report it to the Bay program. There are a couple of things that could have happened. 
Um, so, you know, I, I can't answer what happened there, but, but it may be that it's not accurate, which is fine when you're modeling. You can just maybe start with that and then add or subtract to the practices that, you know, are there. Or maybe you want to start assuming there are no practices implemented and then add some BMPs and say, oh, well, if I'm modeling at a farm scale, let's say this farmer has no practices and we're going to add some cover crops and maybe a buffer, what would the load reduction be? And you can definitely do that. You don't have to use these annual scenarios because um, they 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 do reflect what the state reported, but it may not be uh, necessarily accurate if you have better information on the ground. And I see there's a question yeah. um, about practices implemented on the field. Um, and if they're added to two additional fields within the same farm, we are not counting the number of practices or we, what we are counting are the acres of the practice. So um, if it's manure injection or cover crops, it would be the acres of those. So whether it's on one field or two fields or a hundred fields, we're counting the acres of that practice. Um, not the number of fields. So we would have all of that included. And I think that answers uh, that one question. Let me know if you have a follow-up. Great, so we'll just give it just one more minute, see if anybody else has any questions. And if not, we can wrap it up a little early. Helen, did I miss anything that I should have added? Helen, keeps me honest. I don't know if you wanted to just, while we're waiting, um, share the BMP heat maps. I think we mentioned them, but didn't show them. Yep, uh, and I need to go to- Map, mapping tools. Mapping tools, thank you. Yep. And here's the BMP targeting maps. There's other information here. Um, but if you go to the blue button, BMP targeting maps, this pops up with the ag, nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, urban nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and it is interactive. So I'm going to uh, pick, um, I'm just going to zoom in here to Lancaster, and we can see that most of Lancaster is a dark purple, meaning um, and I can click on that and highlight those dark purple areas. And that would mean that there are uh, high, high delivery factor to the edge of the stream. So it runs off through the soil quickly, um, both surface and groundwater. And it also has a high load. Uh, and if I unclick that purple, I can say, oh, what is this one? Um, you know, this is, and I can get more information. So I want to know, well, why is that one not high like the rest of it? And I can see what the actual pounds are um, for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment at the edge of stream. I can see the name of the county. Uh, I can see some other information here. Um, it's in the Susquehanna River Basin. And I can see that the delivery factor, that it actually delivers 1.21, which means it's, it's delivering some legacy. Uh, that's nitrogen that's probably in the groundwater. Um, phosphorus, it delivers about a third of what is applied. Um, and in this area, this is Conestoga Creek. And if any of y'all are in Pennsylvania, Conestoga Creek has had a lot of, has been a focus area and has had a lot of efforts put in there, which is probably why it has a lower load than the rest of that county. Um, I'm just going to move south of the border. And we're here in Western Maryland. And we are looking at um, and we're we can see the loads here, and we're um, in Carroll County, and this is draining to the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, and it includes the Patapsco and Back Rivers. Um, and it is also draining to Liberty Dam. Um, and you can see uh, the information there. So, um, that's this area here. This area is not going to have any drainage because this is solely Liberty Dam, um, and it's not going to have any runoff. Um, but you know, you can you can look at this throughout the map. But if you want to know well, where is the best areas, then you would click here. It'll take a second to resolve, 
and say, okay, here's where it's the lowest runoff. And again, we've got ag and urban in here. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, we've got agricultural land here. So here are the best areas that are agricultural. Here are the worst areas in terms of runoff that are agricultural. And if I unclick, you can see all of them. And, um, and if I wanted to know just where the delivery factor was highest, I could look here and see there are some pockets, perhaps cars to where it runs off highest. And if I wanted to look and see where are the highest loads, I could say, okay, they're pretty high here. So even though it's high up here in New York, um, high up in the Susquehanna, the delivery factor is not so high. So it's not gonna be as likely to make it all the way down to the bay or all the way to the edge of stream. And these are edge of streams. So um, it's not gonna make it all the way to the edge of the stream in these cases. Uh, because of the soil types, maybe a little more clay in there. And you can do the same for phosphorus and sediment. I don't see any more open questions. Um, no, that's a really neat interactive map. I really like that. Ah, good. Yeah. <laughs> it was recently highlighted on Maryland Public TV, which is kind of fun because I never do anything on TV. And um, they highlighted these maps uh, for the Maryland Bay Awareness Week. Um, this week is Chess is the Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week for all states, but Maryland Public Television holds a, their own Chesapeake Bay Awareness uh, Week, and they highlighted this map as part of that. So, Very it's, cool. It's kind of kind of famous. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put this direct link. Um, I'll send it to Jen to share with with everybody, so you can just have that direct link. And yeah, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Um, here are some next steps in our collective outcomes quantification journey. So first we look forward uh, to you joining us at some or all of the next set of tools training webinars that will be held the first Wednesday of every month, except next month, July, which will once again be moved to the second Wednesday of the month to compensate for the holiday. If you can't make it to one or more of the webinars, but you want, you want to view the session, the recording should be available by the following Monday. Um, at the end of the webinar, please share your feedback with us by answering a quick nine question survey uh, Jen shared the link at the beginning of the session, and it will also appear as a new tab in your internet browser when the a webinar ends. Please take a couple of minutes to share your feedback so we can keep improving these events. And don't forget that you will be entered into a drawing for the $20 to $5 gift card just for filling out the survey. So we thank you in advance for participation and good luck. Uh, Michelle and I are also offering free coaching services to six farm project managers who secure a session with us. These sessions are individually tailored to you uh, to help you figure out which tools or methods are right for your project. So if you're interested, just email me, I should tap Ross, and in the subject line, write coaching request. And finally, uh, if you'd like to order a free print copy or download a PDF of the Outcomes Estimation Tool Guide, which this webinar is based on um, and is pictured to your right, you can visit the report's website, which you can easily find using the keywords AFT Outcomes Tools, or click the link that Jen is sharing in the chat. So thank you again for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you on July 10th. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the opportunity to present. Yes, thank you.